Welcome back to the Policy Biz Podcast. I'm your host, John Schwabish. On this week's episode of the show, I have the one and only Ali Torben joining me on the show. If you listen to Data Viz Podcasts, which you must because you're listening to this podcast, you probably know Ali from her podcast, Data Viz Today. And so I invited Ali over to talk about her own work, talk about her background. We talk about her data art, her data patterns, her illustrations. And we sort of have this plan to talk a little bit more about what data viz will look like going into the future. But we ended up talking about a whole slew of things. We talked about tools. We talked about data viz generally. We talked about our approach. We talked about our processes. We talked about our day-to-day lives and what it means to sort of do all this data viz work. It's a really interesting uh, conversation. This same episode is being posted over on the Data Viz Today podcast, so you can listen to it here. You can listen to it over there to get a different opening, different introduction from Allie. Uh, It's a really interesting conversation. I hope you'll enjoy it, so I'm just going to get right to it. So here's my conversation with Allie Torben, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Hey, Allie. Very excited for this Data Viz Today Policy Viz podcast joint production. How are you? (laughs) Great. Great to see you, John. <laughs> um, we put this off for a long time, so I'm glad we're able to uh, to do this. So we have a kind of unique plan, I think. So we're going to ask each other a question, same, relatively same question, and then we have a plan, right, for, mm-hmm. for a longer discussion. All right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's talk. I'm going to go first, uh, ask you about your day-to-day as a data viz, freelancer, blogger, podcaster, illustrator like all these you've got all these different <laughs> these different things yes. so what does your day-to-day look like i mean maybe pick like your busiest day like what what does that look like oh, okay okay so i'm a freelance information designer dc area just like you uh which means i work on contracts that last anywhere between you know a couple days to a few weeks to a few months small businesses, big businesses, and I just help them communicate visually. I feel like that's the best way to describe it. Since, yeah. like you said, there's it's a wide variety of things. So um, depending on what kind of client I'm working for, like recently I did a infographic for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and that was visually showing an idea um, a process and I illustrated that. So when I do illustration type things, I'm using my iPad and procreate. And then I go back and forth between my computer and my iPad. And then I do traditional data visualizations also. So another, um, project that I worked on was for a large company, uh, a big retailer visually showing um, with Tableau an interactive dashboard about all their inventory. So it was a very similar, but different skill set. And then um, I'm also working for uh, Ben and Becky Jones at dataliteracy.com and helping them communicate data literacy concepts to a wider audience. So I'm blogging, I'm writing, um, I'm illustrating a comic for them to show data literacy um, concepts. So that's kind of my day to day. It's all over the place using different tools. But the underlying thing is that I'm helping people communicate visually with data and information. Do you have um, do you have one of those that you prefer over the other? So you've got like, like, like you had your series on like the wallpaper, which the which I mm-hmm. love and I just like, you've got like, you know, that's sort of like the huge spectrum of possibilities is like from data comics illustration to infographics to like a tableau mm-hmm. dashboard, like just something like, mm-hmm. like what like what makes your heart happy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Because that's there's things that I can do for money, like good yeah. money. And then there's good things, things that I can do that is more, I guess, meditative is yeah. the right word because I picked up the illustration stuff. Cause I've always been kind of interested in it, but uh, during the, when the pandemic first started, I was getting a lot of anxiety yeah. and I discovered illustrating was a, on my phone. I downloaded the procreate app on my yeah. phone and creating these little illustrations, the data viz inspired wallpapers was a really great way for me to uh, not be sucked in by doom scrolling on Twitter <laughs> and <laughs> having in panic yeah. attacks, watching CNN. Yeah. So it really became a meditative practice for me creating illustrations. And that's when I really get lost in, you know, I lose track of yeah. time and I really feel 
fulfilled after I create a illustration or um, some sort of data art piece. And I think I've been trying to find a way to bridge the gap between what do they call it? Like meditative work and communication, meditation and communication, like communicating visually in those two ways. How do you kind of bridge that gap where someone would pay me to create an illustration, (laughs) right? So you got to find a way to use illustration as a way of communication. So if I had to choose a favorite, I think this kind of data comic thing I'm doing for data literacy is really a beautiful marriage between the two. It's me illustrating, which I love to do, storytelling, um, but also communicating important information to people that can have an impact. So that's what I'm really loving doing that's right great. now. Are you a, uh, a comic book reader? No, not I'm not. All. No, not I'm all. not. No, not, not at all. all. Not at all, which is very yeah. funny. I think other than XKCD, I didn't don't really read comics, yeah. but it is an amazing field. I went to the library and just took out all the books they have on <laughs> yeah. comics and they have, um, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you know that it's a very rich field that I can learn from, but yeah, I wasn't really a big comic reader before. Yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just say to, to wrap this, this section up. So I remember seeing Scott McCloud at the mm-hmm. first tapestry conference, give like the closing keynote. And, and it remind you remind me of it because Ben Jones was also there. And I think we like sat next to each other. Um, and Scott McLeod's closing keynote was like one of the most amazing talks I've seen live. And, you know, his book is like, just for me, it was eye opening to see like, oh, there's like a science behind this, the way you do it. And his, the way he presented was both like his slides sort of ran horizontally and then they ran vertically because he's sort of telling these stories through the comics and the comics don't always mm-hmm. run in the panels like left to right, mm-hmm. A, B, C, D, and they can run in different dimensions. And he did that within the presentation. So, um, so, okay. So before I, before I flip that, let me, let me then ask this. So when you think about these comics, are you thinking like as a, as a, as a sort of ne- like a linear storytelling or are you really, cause that's, I think how we think about like data viz is like this line goes up. Um, mm-hmm. but you have more freedom with the comics. So like, do you change your, your thought process with stories? Hmm. Yeah, it's Scott McCloud has many books and I skimmed through many of them from the library. And one of the things that he, one of the techniques he suggested was you write out, you know, you have your main plot uh, storyline, you know, the intro, and then you have the conflict and the resolution. So you have to think in those terms, like general storytelling terms. Um, But then you also have to think about what you're going to show visually, what you're going to show with words, and then what you're going to show as a combination of the two. And then how, what view you're going to show within each frame, how much time yeah. you're going to skip within each frame. So it is very complex. And in my mind, you know, I don't have that much experience doing it, but the way that I find myself thinking about it is almost like, um, in snapshots of time. Mm. So here's the quick view. Here's what I'm trying to communicate visually and through words in this snapshot of time. Then I'm, what am I going to show in this snapshot of time? Um, and how am I going to do it very efficiently? So yeah. it sits within a page. Right. So what I like to do is write out all the information I need to convey in this. Um, and then what the story is going to be like the characters doing things to convey that information. And then I go back and I circle the things that I'm going to show visually. And then the things I'm going to show with words and with right. both. So it is, it, it, you do have to think quite li- differently than you do when yeah. you're creating a d- data. It sounds like a lot of planning. Yes, yeah. it is. That's it's very front loaded with planning right. and just like a podcast, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we don't even need to get into you, all that. Yeah. You do a lot of <laughs> planning and scripting right. and editing and everything. And then you get the 20 minutes, beautiful package. You mean you don't end. just like flip on the microphone and do a podcast and you're done? <laughs> Chit chat. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's my day. Yeah. If I may now hear about your day, because I think you are in a super a unique situation where you are doing your own research, creating your own data visualizations for your research, but then also like a whole nother side career of helping other people yeah. uh, get better at their data visualizations. So what does your day even look like? Yeah, it's uh, it's a little crazy. So I've got a, a, a almost full-time job, so I'm not quite 100% at the Urban Institute. And at Urban, 
I split my time. So half of my time is doing research and half of my time is in the communications department. So hmm. it's an interesting split. It's, um, you know, a, a lot of people ask me like, why don't I just do policy viz, like consulting stuff full time, but I really mm -hmm. still identify as a researcher, as an economist. And I really like working not only with the people that I work with at urban, but also just like on those topics that I just, that are really important, right? Like, um, a lot of the work I've done during the pandemic was on nutrition issues. So like, how do we feed kids from low income households who, when they're in school, they participate in the school breakfast program or the school lunch program, and they get, that's how they, you know, that's how they're getting meals. Mm -hmm. What do you do when there is no school, right? Like how, how do you get food to, to these kids and how do we do so efficiently and, you know, w within budget and, you know, lots of different questions. Um, and then I've been doing a lot more research over the last six months or so on disability issues. So it's an issue, a topic area that I worked on a lot a few years ago, and it sort of gotten a little quiet on the policy front. And now it's sort of come back. Uh, there's a lot of questions, obviously, on sort of uh, the Social Security side of things, which is where I spent my early career working on. Um, and now what where I'm finding is this uh, discussion of the intersection between uh, people with disabilities and food insecurity. So how do we look at those, those two topics together? But then there's the whole data viz side of things. Um, and I would say there's a lot of overlap between the stuff I do at urban and the stuff I do at policy viz. So it's a lot of, um, same sort of thing that, that you mentioned a lot of consulting. I'll say that more recently, I'd say, especially during the pandemic, um, it's been a lot of like critical reviews for, uh, people and organizations, which I really have come to enjoy. So they'll say, look, we have this internal report, or we have this series of web pages, or we have this Tableau dashboard. Um, can you provide us, you know, can you give us feedback? And so I'll go through and sort of basically write up a report. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a kind of a system set up for that. So like, I have a kickoff call, so I can understand, I think, you know, you and I probably see eye to eye in a lot of this, like, it's one thing to be like, can you critique our dashboard or our visualization or our infographic or our comic, right? But like, if I don't know what you're trying to get across or who your audience is or, you know, what the most important data points are, it's like critiquing a visualization just for the sake of critiquing it isn't particularly useful. Mm -hmm. um, I say that even though I've been doing these like data viz critiques on my YouTube channel, like, you know, <laughs> uh, but, you know, okay. Um but it, but I think it's an, it, you know, it's it's more important to get that 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 audience piece. I think is the most important part. Um, I had no idea that um, that this whole critique thing was a, uh, I don't know, a business. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's and it's great because um, what I like really like about it is it empowers the organization and the people in the organization to be better at their visualizations and going forward. So mm -hmm. they could hand something to me and say, here's a bunch of data. Can you make something for us? And yeah, I could do that. My basic toolkits, I think as most people know, is like Excel, R, and Tableau. And I'm by no means an expert in Tableau. So usually I'll call up, you know, another Tableau person to help me with the Tableau stuff. But um, I actually like the critique part because I can say, look, you know, let's examine this particular visualization. And um, here's what I would do differently. Here's where you're not telling the right story. And if they, once we have, like, I'll deliver the report and then we'll have a long call. And what it does is empower them to say, oh yeah, okay, I can see why this one thing that John mentioned is a better way to do it. And then they can carry that forward into all of their mm -hmm. other work. So, um, so I find it really rewarding because it's, what is that? What is that saying? It's like teach a person to fish, mm -hmm. give a person, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. You know that saying, give a person a fish yeah. and, and, and I, I read something um, a couple of weeks ago that it's not just about teaching someone to fish, but it's also teaching them to fish and giving them the fishing rod, right? So you need to give them the tool. So as an example, um, I'm working with a, a client um, that does, um, they're a private sector, they do uh, reviews on pension programs. And so I can discuss their visualizations and what they're, what I think is good and bad about these visualizations. But we had long discussions early on about the way that they were presenting them in these long like PDF uh, decks was cumbersome. It was difficult to move the data from one thing to another. And so um, 
we talked about lots of different toolkits and they ended up uh, through long conversation we had, they ended up going to Flourish. They're using the, the Flourish tool. And so what they can do with Flourish is they can basically create kind of a stepper. So it's kind of like a, you think about a stepper or a slide deck, but it's in Flourish. Um, mm -hmm. It's interactive. So they get sort of these additional components. And, and so they have this new toolkit. So it's not just about saying, you know, this bar chart would be better off as you know, some other chart, but it's also saying, this bar chart would be better off as a line chart. And it would be better if you didn't, you know, weren't doing, I don't know, the small multiples in Excel because you're doing 40 of them and you're updating it every week. That's not mm -hmm. an efficient use of your time. Let me show you how to do this in R or do it in Tableau or let's figure out how to do it in Flourish. Um, mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's a really interesting combination of it's like strategy, training, and yeah. delivering a product. Yeah. And it's, and it's at the end of the day, it's like, you know, they're still going to create it. I'm not going to, you know, I can help them create it, but they're going to mm -hmm. do it. And so once our relationship ends, they're, you know, I try to, I hope that they're sort of off on their own and, and ready to, mm -hmm. ready to go. Um, how do people, how, how do people find you to do that work? Or like what, if somebody wanted to get that work done, what kind of words are they searching for, you think? Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a really good question. And like, I bet if we had like Cole Naflick on, on chatting with us, she would know like the best, like best marketing. I'm like really terrible at that. But <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, you know, I mean, I, I think as you've probably experienced too, the, as you put out content and you say, you know, I mean, I think I've been trying to, you know, focus on this word critique a little bit and, and redesign and, empowering. And I think there's just like, there's key words around data and data viz and mm -hmm. data communication. Um, I mean, I find a lot of my work comes through word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. And I have, especially through my work at Urban, where I do very similar sorts of things, but Urban has, um, because it's a nonprofit uh, and nonpartisan nonprofit has some specific funding principles. So like a firm that won't, so this is sort of the weird split, right? Firms that won't abide by those or, or don't abide, but don't fall under those those funding principles, that's where I'll do the policy based work. So that's sort of the, okay. the split. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'll do work for, uh, you know, research programs where they'll have like a cohort of, of research teams that they're guiding through. And a lot of these programs um, through different funders and different universities, they're teaching, especially young scholars, data viz and presentations and how to write and how to communicate and how to talk to the media. And so there's all these different pieces and how to do research, right? How to, mm -hmm. how to do better at your statistics and your regressions and your mapping and whatever it is. And so I'm uh, often just a component of these programs that are being put together. And so, um, you know, I'll do one for university of such and such, and then university of so-and-so will email me and said, Oh, I heard that you're doing this program, you know? Uh -huh. So, I mean, that's the best, right? Like, I mean, I'm sure you've had this experience, right? Like that's the best feeling. When someone emails you and said, oh, I heard from so-and-so that you do a great thing. You know, we'd like to, we'd like to bring you on. That's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's better than like, I saw your website or I, you know, I saw this thing. Do you do this? It's like, yeah, they, they're a little bit more committed to the relationship. Yeah. Right, than, hey, yeah. are you going to be cheap? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, the days are, are a bit. A, a bit hectic, I would say. I would say during the the one thing about the pandemic that has been a little bit advantageous, <laughs> um, work wise, not like work balance wise, work life balance wise for sure, but like not having my hour commute into mm -hmm. DC, mm -hmm. you know, I can jump on the email at 7 a.m. and, you know, bang out 30 minutes of email mm -hmm. um, and then go and work out or, you know, get the kids to wherever they have to go. Um, and then sort of come back. So there's that like early morning part where my workflow is just like, I like to kind of like bang some easy, like the low hanging fruit stuff, like bang that out real quick and then, you know, get into the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know how things will change for me once the world opens back up and I'm back in the office um, and kids are back in school, yes. hopefully crossing fingers. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> are, do you have another book planned? Because it seems like oh, writing God. a book is... <laughs> So much work. I don't know why anybody does it actually, but yeah, I I'm don't gonna... know. <laughs> it's like owning a house. Like you just bought a house, right? Like, yes. like it's the same thing. Like, why does anybody ever buy a house? It's just mm. like, yeah, yes. um, more headaches. But it, I do headaches. love your book. It's kind of like the I don't want to say dictionary, but almost like 
a dictionary for database yeah. where you can just go in and get some inspiration, understand uh, better data visualizations is what we're talking about. Yeah. And it's it's really great that you can get uh, inspiration, but also learn about the chart type and see examples. So I, I can tell that it took so much work to put together. Yeah. And funny that like before we got on this call, I was emailing with my editor because we're like fixing some typos and oh. like have to go through back through some images and like renumber uh, them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. The book was the book. The book, um, I think, turned out, you know, how longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, but yeah, it, it is that sort of encyclopedia of, of graph types. I have a couple of ideas for a next book, but I don't have the energy like mm -hmm. I have, you know how it, it yeah. takes you time, but I actually, I'm going to turn this back to you. So like, do you see a book in your future? Like, and specifically I'm wondering, like, do you see like a date of his comic book in your future? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to talk to Ben about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just like, <laughs> no, I, I think, think like SKCD yeah. seems like the only one that would be like even close. Yeah. There, there are actually some, I mean, there are like drawing ones. Yeah, more, like funny. Like pun. Yeah, like puns. Date like right. date of his with puns, like Michelle. Right, right, right. Real, real. Same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So right. More like date of um, his puns. One. But yeah, I think that if I were to do something, I think I should. I think maybe you can give me some advice on this. But if I'm going to mix a book, it should be on one of the topics where I feel very. Uh, motivated and I enjoy yeah. doing it. And I think from your earlier question, what's the kind of work that kind of gives me the most joy, uh, that yeah. kind of thing is the, is the thing. So I think if I were to do a book, it probably would be around something where I could do a lot of illustrations. Yeah. I mean, I think the key is to, for me, at least it's something that, yeah, gives you joy because mm -hmm. you're going to spend a year or two writing it and like, you don't, you don't want it to be like something that you hate and something where you have, you know, I, I think it's like where you have something to say and where you can add value to people, especially in our line of work, you add value to people, how they're going to do their data biz work. And mm -hmm. I think your comic stuff and your illustration just more generally, like, I think those have those elements to it, right? Like it does give people, first off it gives, well, I'll speak for myself. It does give me joy to see those wallpapers. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's just great. But I think, you know, you have things to say about data biz and the process and how people do their work. And, and so there's value there. And I think to help people do their own data biz, I think there's, there's a, there's a, there's a niche there mm -hmm. uh, that I think you can, you can fit into. But yeah. I would say for anybody thinking about writing a book, like be prepared. Yes. <laughs> you have to really love the to topic, really right? Love <laughs> <laughs> and be organized. Like that's the other thing is like, and I, I, I have on my, my little, my little, uh, index card. Here's like my day-to-day, -day, like index card of lists is like organize all the images from my book. Oh gosh. Um, cause like we, I have the full list and then like some were edited and then there were typos fixed and they're just, they're all over the place mm -hmm. and they're not in like one directory. And it, yeah. I try to be organized, so <laughs> stay organized. Yeah. You did a lot of managing files. Oh my God. Yes. Oy, <laughs> oy, oy. Well, I really loved hearing about your day because I was always wondering kind of how you balanced all your stuff. But yeah. I also have a second burning question that I okay. really, really want to talk to you about. Yeah. So I was listening a little back backstory, listening to a podcast called um, The Business of Authority. And they were talking about uh, one of the hosts is a web developer. And he was talking about how some careers have expiration dates. Uh, because you get your uh, your career so wrapped up in a particular tool that, you know, eventually tools go out. I mean, what is right. it that Jeff Bezos, I think, quote where he said, someone asked him, uh, what do you think is going to be different in 10 years? And he was like, what's not going to be different in 10 <laughs> years? Yeah, right. And so as a database designer, Everybody wants to talk about tools, right? And yeah. everybody thinks it's kind of about the tool. And I was thinking, well, how am I going to most efficiently future-proof my career? And kind of what are the other skills that are super important for me to be focusing on honing, not like getting secondary, but focus on honing. So when yeah. Tableau or sorry, I don't want to name any names, but like any, any tool, really right. any tool no, any goes, yeah. goes out or people move to the next tool, right? 
right. What's what are the skills that are going to make me be a successful data viz designer right now on Earth or ten years from now on Mars? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> well, it's a it's a it's a great question because. Like if we think about our current toolkits, right, from Tableau to Excel to JavaScript to Flourish to data, you know, whatever, whatever the tools are, like eventually uh, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality are going to be a thing, right? I mean, I think to date we sort of like, it hasn't quite worked. I mean, maybe some of the augmented reality or like the weather channel where they have mm -hmm. like the water flowing up, but like that's going to be a thing. And like, I have no idea how like i'm not going to go learn like virtual reality mm -hmm. tools like i just don't see that mm -hmm. so but i think the the core of of communicating data will still be similar right like so like the central tenets of like how do you communicate your message how do you explain to people how to use different graphs mm -hmm. um and and so I, I guess you know my question to you would be like in terms of a lot of the stuff that you're doing, because it's illustration, mm -hmm. like I feel like the illustration will always have a place. Mm -hmm. And I and I feel like we had this like real run up on like digital tools. And then there was this big pullback or, or I guess pushback really from a lot of different parts of the field to say, why can't we just do more drawing, mm -hmm. right? And it's like uh, you and XKCD is an example and and Stephanie and Georgia doing Dear Data and, and data sketches. And, and there's just like a lot of projects. So like, do you think even 10 years from now when you're on Mars that like illustration and sketching will be such a such a central part of the field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I think that, um, you know, people drew on in caves. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, right. you, you want to be able to um, write things down and show people things visually. And where I think no matter what your tool set is, like if you're holding a pen in your hand or you are, you know, neck deep in JavaScript, you the skill of being a partner with the person with information mm -hmm. is kind of the the big skill you know like yeah. my first job out of college was a business analyst and i was helping gather requirements for software development and at first i was like i cannot believe this is a job <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't know this was a job, but you know, there has to be someone who's talking to the client, figuring out what they want to do, writing, writing down the requirements, and then talking to someone who knows the tool and translating that into a solution. So, um, there's the tool part, which is, we were talking about, but I think yeah. as the tools change, you know, the person who is coding things up, they lose a little bit of value if somebody, uh, changes the tool randomly. Like they have no control, right. they have no control over that. No control of that. But right. the skill of knowing how to draw that information out of a client and translate it for a technical person. I, f I feel like that's the skill. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I wonder whether, I mean, I, I think, so I've said for a while, and I think we agree on this, that there's not like a person that can do all of this, right? That can do the data work and the design and the, I guess, computer science or building the visualization. Mm -hmm. There's all these different pieces of it. And I've sort of said for a while, there's like the goal for us as individuals is not to be able to do all of that, like the unicorn, right? That we need these teams. And, I, I, and, and my, my instinct is that that will become even more the case as the technology and the tools become more complicated, mm -hmm. uh, become more intricate when we think about different platforms, right? Like we went from a world where it was like printed on the newspaper to printed newspaper and on a computer mm -hmm. to printed on the newspaper, desktop computer, phone, tablet. Now we're going to start adding virtual reality, augmented reality, whatever the other communication devices are so that so the platforms change and are going to evolve. And, and I just, my instinct is that teams are going to be just so much more important mm -hmm. in the future, which we could discuss, I think, for a long time, what like, how is that going to work in a post-pandemic world of like a mixed hybrid in-person virtual world? That's like a different discussion. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I to your point about like, the the key is how to draw out those insights and then how to communicate them. I, I still think these, I still think teams are going to be 
so crucial mm-hmm. to that. Um, what about, uh, I think, I guess we're just talking about being a generally a good consultant, right? <laughs> like knowing, right. Knowing, yeah. knowing which questions to ask, which you do need to have expertise yeah. to, yeah. which maybe you got by having a tool, by knowing a tool and having experience with it. So you have expertise, which means that you know which questions to ask mm-hmm. um, when you're talking to somebody. So that means if you hone your skill on translating your expertise into questions, then you doesn't matter what tool you use. Right. And I, yeah. And, and I, yeah. So I don't think the tool, well, again, it sort of depends, but I would say the tool itself matters less than the, than, than the crucial, than the crucial thing that you just mentioned, which is this translation, mm. right? And how do you know what are the right questions to ask? And how do you find that insight? Because at the end of the day, you know, for example, if I had a client that said, we want you to critique this and, you know, I give them all this feedback and they say, okay, you know, you've convinced us that we should go to a Tableau solution or we should go to a comic book solution. Can you do that for us? And I would say, well, no, but I can call my friend Allie and she and I can work together and we can, you know, work amongst the two of us and Allie can draw the comics Mm -hmm. for you. And then we could, then we can deliver that back to you. And so again, I don't think it's, it's the tool specific. I I always try to be tool agnostic. Um, And, and hopefully people have seen that in, in the better data viz book that like my goal in all those images I used so many different tools in that book. Like I did my like real first, like stuff in JavaScript. I did a lot of R. I did a lot of Tableau. I did a bunch of illustrator. I did raw graphs. I did data wrapper. I did you know, a lot in Excel. Like I used all those tools and hopefully, uh, when you read the book, you can't really tell which tool was used to make those mm-hmm. things, except for, except for, I will admit that the matrix does look very tabular. <laughs> it's, like that's, it's that's hard not the to. <laughs> But I ran out of, I ran out of energy by the time I got to like, you know, it's like a 10 by, t- you know, 15 by 15 grid. And I didn't feel like just doing all the yeah. hard work. Like it was so easy mm-hmm. in Tableau. So like <laughs> pipe it to Illustrator, just kind of be done. Um, because it, 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 it doesn't really, and I know lots of people disagree with us on this, right? Because there is like the Tableau camp and the mm-hmm. R camp and the Python mm-hmm. camp and the JavaScript camp. But I just think a tool is a tool. And if you're a shop that uses Microsoft, and you have Excel is already in your budget because you're spending, you need Word and PowerPoint. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with Excel. Are you going to use Excel to build interactive dashboards online? Mm-hmm. No, like, but that's not what it's mm-hmm. built for. And are you going to use, I don't know, I'll take another example, you know, Power BI to build some sort of beautiful looking custom thing that would show up on the New York Times uh, website? No, probably not. Like, that's not what it's mm-hmm. built for. Um, and you know, as the, to your point about the evolution of new tools, we're going to have to be flexible with that. We're going to have to be able to say, this tool is great for this, but not for this other thing. I think like the new tool that I've seen a lot more of is the observable Mm -hmm. notebooks that, you know, Mike Bostock has, has started and popularized. And I think where I see that is it's taking JavaScript and also these other, other programming languages, but primarily I think, I think, not my area, but primarily JavaScript and making it more collaborative, Mm -hmm. right? And that's where the teamwork comes in, right? Where you are creating these observable notebooks where people can go in and they can see your code and they can add onto the code and they can, they can edit the code. And, and, you know, I think that embodies this whole idea of Mm -hmm. teams and organizations working together. And um, I just think that's, I I think uh, back to your point, Ali, I think the, the, the key questions and finding insight, like that's, that's not going to change how the tools change and how we interact with people that is going to continue mm, to evolve. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because I, I think that if, if specializing in a tool and being really good at a tool is really important and there, it's, it can be very yeah. lucrative and very yeah. helpful. And if you are part of the team, you know, you, you do need to have a specialization if you're part of a team. Right. So you're, you will need right. probably to be using um, a tool, but I, I personally, and I hope other people kind of also keep in the back of their mind that they need to be honing a skill beyond, um, 
beyond yes. the tool and be thinking about putting their expertise into questions and also honing their ability to communicate with another team, uh, which I guess is a skill across any, a great skill across any field. Yeah. But, but I think you make a great point because you could be a JavaScript programmer, like a D3 programmer, and you could love to code and you could love to be neck deep in code all day, but you need to be able to say to the, the rest of your team, you know, the way we've thought about this as I work with the code and as I build the visualization, we're not quite telling the mm -hmm. story that I think mm -hmm. you want to tell. So I, yeah, I agree that there's a specialization that's needed. I think that's, I mean, that's how you build the unicorn, right? You have different people specialized, but you have to, I think I'd put it this way. You have to be able to respect and understand all these different skill sets, right? Like in my experience, a lot of researchers that I've worked with, particularly economists, because we economists tend to look down on everybody. <laughs> so like, that's just a whole other problem. But like, it, it was especially early on in my experience at, at particularly at Urban where people would say, you know, oh, we, we wrote this you know, 200 page report. Can you help put this onto a web page, you know, by the end of the week? And it's like, no, like building those web pages and building data visualizations and, and doing the design, these are all skills and they take time and they take expertise. And it's not just like pressing a button to get mm -hmm. this stuff done. And I think if, whatever of these different areas that you're that you're doing whether it's the coding or the statistics or the illustration or the writing to be able to understand and respect that all these skills are skills and they take time and expertise to build together i think that's where we end up with with really successful mm -hmm. projects yeah that's a great point do you have um when you're so you're you you have a lot of of these questions this exp expertise built up um, do you have, when you're doing these consulting projects, are you, do you have a, uh, maybe a list of questions or a template that you work off of as you're consulting with people? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I do. And I don't. So I have a couple of like templates that I use for things. I will say I'm, I'm more formal about presentations than I am really about data viz. I have sort of like four or five questions about data viz that I tend to ask, but it's not like. I have it written down. It's sort of like always in the mm -hmm. back of my mind. It's like, who is your audience? Like, especially if like uh, someone said, I, actually yesterday, a colleague sent me like a few briefs to look through and they were like, it was a series of stacked bar charts. And it was like, we'd really like to like change things up, maybe show some different things. So like first question is always like, who is the audience? What do you want them to know? Who, you know, are they policymakers? Are they researchers? Like, who is it? And then like it, to me, it's always like, is it important for the reader to see the exact values, right? Is it like 2% and 1.9% or is it like this thing's mm -hmm. bigger than this other thing? And then like when it's, when it's helpful when it's specific, cause I can say, is it important to see this part to whole relationship or is it a level mm -hmm. question, right? So like a little more into the weeds. With presentations it's, it's I have like a, a worksheet that I send. It's a two page worksheet that, that I send people. I'm like, here are the 10 questions you need to answer and fill this out and then we'll have a call about it but I need to know these, these, these answers. And it comes right out of my, right out of my first book. I mean, they're not, I mean, I'm sure you've had this experience, but they're not like groundbreaking mm -hmm. questions. They're just like prompting people to think hard about these things where they're just like mm -hmm. taking it for granted. So, so do you have like a specific Ye like script? I, I wouldn't call it a script, but since I can't lean on, you know, a, as as many years as you have of expertise, I I realized that I can't remember everything. It'll become second nature at some point, but I can't remember everything. So I did yeah. every time I'm in a meeting and I somehow ask a question that made a really good answer come back, I write it down. Like for example, yeah, that's um, a good idea. we were I was working with a client. We were trying to figure out which metrics to show on this dashboard. And I was like, what would you see on a dashboard that would make you pick up the phone and call your boss? <laughs> because yeah. that's what we need to yeah. be showing on this dashboard. And so I wrote that question down. So I think that's a great yeah, skill for one. anybody that's listening is to um, notice when you're asking good questions and then write them down. And then over time, you're going to have this amazing questionnaire <laughs> that you, you can pull from yeah. and be, be right. that person who's um, can be a great data viz designer without... Uh, a, a special, a specific tool. So have you gotten to the point where you'll send them 
like that questionnaire as you get started or is it more an informal you have your your list next to you as you're on the phone or do you send them like here's a word document fill these out and then we can have a call to, to so talk more about so far it. it's been better for me to be on a call and then i walk through it because then there's just too many questions mm -hmm. that uh don't apply and I don't want them to be confused by yeah. it. And um, so then I get to pick. And then also some just, some need a little bit more pulling. So I like, I have a whole section on art yeah. direction because I feel like that's very important depending on what you're doing, of course. But if it's, if it's applicable, right. it's very important. But a lot of people don't really understand what I'm asking. Like, how do you want people mm, to feel right. during this vision when they see this graphic? And a lot of people are just like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Choose the happy face or the sad face. Like where so do you want to So I have to right. feed some words and some adjectives so we can talk about it. So I have found that um, it works better for me so far to have a call about it rather than sending it to them and yeah. answering it. But like you said, if you do have like the three basic questions that you always ask, I can definitely see how that would work where you send that to them ahead of time. Right. So then let me, uh, to, so to the tools part of our discussion. So when you're having this, um, I, I guess sort of more or less towards the beginning of the, of the engagement, do you talk about tools and do you, do you, well, I, I guess there's kind of two questions here. So do you talk about tools and like what their toolkit solution is and maybe what mm -hmm. they would want to evolve to? And do you also like bring in, I mean, presumably a lot of people are finding you because a lot mm -hmm. of your illustration work. And I, I just wonder like, you know, it's so pervasive now to be like, let's make a dashboard and let's make a JavaScript thing. But like, do you talk to people about like, yeah, maybe a comic or an illustration would actually be a solution to this particular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely talking, asking about tools because first of all, I have to know if I can help them with what they need. Because <laughs> sometimes, you you know, sometimes yeah, people right, like, yeah. oh, well, we only use Power BI. I'm like, well, I don't know Power BI. So like, there's really only so right, much. Right, <laughs> Maybe I'm not I the right do, person like, for you. a strategy yeah. piece right. at the beginning or a discovery piece, but yeah. I can't actually follow through for you. So I'm, I am definitely talking about tools right. beforehand and suggesting things that I know because I am talking to a lot of data biz people. So I do know that there's um, a lot of options out there and I know a lot of options that other people don't know. So um, I am definitely talking talking about tools and helping people figure out what they need um, from a selfish perspective to see if I can help them, but also so they can benefit from my expertise as well. Because a tool expertise yeah. is actually... I don't know, I, I, a subset, maybe that's the thing that we're talking about. Yeah. Just making sure that you know that the yeah. tool expertise is a subset of your, your data viz expertise. Yeah. I mean, I, I think to your point, like it is knowing, being an expert or being really good, I'm not being an expert, whatever that means, but being really good at a tool is certainly helpful because like you said, if someone wants a Power BI solution and you know how to do Power BI, then you're the person. But I also think, again, to your point, if someone wants a Power BI solution, you don't do Power BI, but mm -hmm. you could set them up to be successful. And then to say, hey, I can link you. I, you know, I have a list of people that do Power BI that I know that I can that I put you in touch with. I think as, as freelancers and just as people, like that's just like yeah. a good strategy, right? To like just, just help them uh, find that solution. Um, so we got we got a little bit away from our our core question of like what's the future, but like I think these are all mm -hmm. really interesting strategies mm -hmm. and, and techniques. Um, I just I, I want to ask you one one last question. Like coming out of the pandemic, um, as we sort of move towards whatever world we're going to be in, which I think my instinct is it'll be sort of mm -hmm. sort of hybrid world where like there's going to be more Zoom meetings and in person and and this and that like do you think that's going to change how we i'll say as we as like consultants or data biz creators do you think that's going to change how we do our work i i'm hoping that data viz designers uh see more of a future for themselves outside of a they're the one job that they have or the one yeah. tool set that they use. I guess that's why I, I'm very interested in talking about this topic right now because the pandemic, it just made me feel, want to think a little bit more holistically about 
um, because you can see how quickly things can change. So it's just like right. how maybe that's where this discussion came from is just how am I going to make sure that I can continue to be a data biz designer no matter what happens, because so many different things can happen and companies can go under and yeah. uh, tools can crop up out of nowhere. So I just want to make sure that I'm staying um ahead of it. So I do feel like I'm hoping that after the pandemic, people will uh, think outside of their tool expertise and think more, more holistically yeah. about their, their careers. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's, a, that's, I think that's, I know, I think that's a great point. I, I'll also say that I, uh, and I wrote about this a while ago, I was really worried about the the economy sort of turning and moving into into recession because the sort of i would say the peak of like professional data biz development hadn't really experienced a mm -hmm. recession right so coming out of like the great recession 2008 2007 2008 we had had this like prolonged period of economic growth and i was really worried that the first thing companies and organizations would cut would be their creative departments or the data biz departments because you know maybe that's not central mm. to their to their mission of selling widgets or you know services whatever but i don't think that happened i i, I think I, because right? of I mean, the popularity think, of these covid charts yeah <laughs> i think it's gotten bigger right yeah that's field. right <laughs> yeah yeah and so you know i think there's there's more i think there's more appreciation mm -hmm. there's more value there um and so yeah i think i think broadening and just i think for all of us recognizing that data viz is not a single thing, right? I think you and I have had the same experience with doing our podcasts, right? That every guest comes to this field from like a totally mm -hmm. different place. And so because people are coming from a different place and because there's so many skills sort of intertwined in there, that it's not to be successful, I think it's not just about being mm -hmm. doing one thing. It's about, and it can be that one tool, be the expert in that in, whatever that one tool is, but also these other pieces that are around it and being able to ask these questions and being able to look at the data and being able to tell stories. I think all of these are, are part of this rather complex field. And it's not just like, you know, yes, painting yes. pretty pictures, right? There's, there's yep, more it's all to about it. communication. <laughs> All about communication. Um, this has been so much fun. This uh, data viz today yes. policy viz joint. Uh, <laughs> well, podcast. thank you. Um, no, thank you so for being so on my show. <laughs> uh, thank you for being on my show. This thanks, is great. Jen. All right, um, I will Bye. talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Ellie. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ali. Really recommend you check out her webpage, AliTorben.com. Also check out her podcast, Data Viz Today. You can download it from all the major uh, podcast providers just like you can with this show and check out her episodes uh, when they come out. So until next time, this has been the Policy Viz Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.